verses 1 through 21. <clears throat> My theme for today is that with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> is there any, anything that you consider impossible in your life? Because impossibility has to do with our perspective about it. What is your perspective on impossibility? You know, when we think of impossible, the word impossible, what's in your mind right away? Let me tell you a story about an automobile genius by the name of Henry Ford. Anybody knows him? Yes. Yes. Anybody here that drives a Ford? I don't. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yes. And most of the, what, Japanese cars? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, Henry Ford, he gathered all his engineers and he said, you know what? I have an idea. We are going to do a project. We are going to build an engine that is called V8. Okay, so Mr. Henry Ford was so excited about this project that they're going to embark. But you know what? The engineers didn't like it. Why? Why do you think they didn't like it? Because they said in their minds, this is outrageous. This can't be done. This is impossible, Mr. Henry. Now, do you have things that you call impossible? Do you have a circumstances right now that you consider impossible? Let me tell you this. In human perspective, we are so limited that we cannot see the whole thing. We cannot see the whole picture. Amen? Let's look at... Uh, Webster uh, definition of the word impossible. Oh, is that in there? Oh, okay. Well, let me define that to you then. Oh, he's working on it. Okay, word impossible, as Webster defines it, it is an incapable of being or incapable of occurring. The other meaning is it is insuperably difficult. And the other synonym of this word is hopeless. <laughs> Can't be done. Won't work. Do we have that kind of view as well? Sometimes with our overwhelming circumstances. <laughs> hey man, do we have that sometimes? Okay, let's look at the divine perspective. Let me tell you this. In God's vocabulary, this in this word doesn't exist. Can you say amen? amen? There's no such word in God's vocabulary, the word impossible. Amen. Because with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Amen. Jeremiah 32 verse 17 says, Our Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and an outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. How does that sound? And then later on in that chapter, in chapter 32, verse 27, God confirmed the words of Jeremiah, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. There is nothing difficult for me to do. Amen. Okay, let's look at the New Testament about this perspective of impossibility. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, we can see Mary here was visited by an angel. And the angel told her that, hey, with God, nothing is impossible. Why do you think the angel didn't say that? Because she's going to have a baby. But she doesn't have any boyfriend. How can that be? Think about that. Impossible. The other thing is, her cousin Elizabeth is barren, but she's going to have a baby too. And that's, the baby is what? 
John the Baptist. Think about that. And the angel says, for God, nothing is impossible. Let's look at what Jesus says about impossibility. In Luke 18, chapter 27. Now, the scene here, we can see that the rich young ruler asked Jesus what he needs to do in order to inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> what does he need to do in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, you know, Jesus told him about what says in the law or what says in the scriptures. And what did he say? Oh, I did that since I was a boy. I did all that. Okay. Then Jesus said, okay, why don't we do this? Why don't you give all your possessions to the poor and come follow me? What happened to the rich young ruler? He is went away. He went away. Why? And Jesus said to the crowd, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So then the crowd asked him, who then can be saved? This guy followed the law. He's rich. You know, for them, if you are rich, you are blessed by God. That's their mentality. So if this guy cannot be saved, how much more the poor? No. They cannot buy their way into heaven, right? But Jesus said, with God, nothing is impossible. Amen? And this is Jesus saying here. Now let's look at a biblical example here. Okay? We're going to look at John chapter 6. You can look at your Bible with me, okay? So you can follow me. <clears throat> let's look at verses 1 through 4. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, Fort or Tiberias. And a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing on the sick. So Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Okay. And you see the scene. You know, if you're watching a movie, look at the scene here. Passover is at hand, so people are gathered for this feast. There's a lot of people in there. It's a large crowd. And what are the crowd doing there? They want to see Jesus. Because Jesus was performing miracles. Now, this miracle of five loaves and two fish, this is the fourth miracle that he did already. Okay? So the first one was? Turning water into wine. Then, turning water into wine. And you know, Jesus is not ready to do that. But his mother was so persistent that he has to do it. <laughs> because Jesus said, you know what? This is not my time yet to show off. To show who he is. Amen? Okay. So we see the scene. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the setting here. Because here, if you look at the disciples' perspective on this huge crowd that they see, it's overwhelming. And these people are trying to get to know Jesus. They want to see Jesus. So maybe you will see the exhaustion here of the disciples trying to stop these people. Hey, back off! Okay? Back off! But for Jesus, this is not something that violates their, their privacy. Okay? Because, you know, Jesus has been preaching the whole day. And now this is afternoon, you know? Maybe Jesus was exhausted too. You have to understand, when Jesus came on earth, he did not pretend to be a man. He was a true man. Amen? He did not pretend to be a human being. He was a real one. Amen? Okay. 
So you will see the uh, dilemma of these disciples. But for Jesus, oh no. For Jesus, this is an opportunity. Opportunity for what? This is his opportunity to show his glory and what he can do, his power. And not only that, the purpose of this opportunity is to strengthen his disciples' faith. Okay? Are you following me? Amen. Okay. You know, sometimes great opportunities often disguised as impossibility or unsolvable problems. You know, if I, if I see Reverend or Jethro, you know, it's really hard for them to think that you tell them, okay, why don't you drive the car today? And they do that. Huh? And they do that. It's impossible, right? But for an adult, is that impossible? No. Of course. But there are adults <laughs> that cannot drive. Because they're scared to drive. <laughs> okay, it's not impossible. Okay. Okay, okay. So let's look at this. This is a chance for Jesus to reveal his glory and at the same time to strengthen the faith of his disciples. Let's look at verse 5. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked him, Hello. Ah, okay. Now, what is the purpose of Jesus of doing this to Philip. We can see that in verse 6. In verse 6, he asked this to test him. For he himself knew what he is going to do. You know, sometimes when we have our overwhelming circumstances, our trying moments, how do we view them? Huh? How do we view them? It's like these things are not welcome to you. You don't expect them. Let me tell you this. You have to expect these things in your life. And when they come, you have to welcome them with open arms. Why? Why? Because this is going to help you become strong in your faith. Remember what James said. Consider it pure joy when you are facing various trials. Knowing that the, this trial is a test of your faith. And this will develop perseverance, endurance, so that you will be complete, perfect, lacking in nothing. How's that sound? Did you think about that? So when you have these circumstances of impossibility, huh? Welcome with open arms. And expect them that they will come. They will come. Because you know what? You cannot say that you are an overcomer, an overcomer if you haven't tested. You didn't go to war. Right? How can you say that you are a winner if you didn't participate in, in the competition? Hello? Does it make sense? Okay. Let's continue. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. What did Paul say about this? All things work together for the good of those who love God. For those who are called according to His purpose. Look at that. Think about that. That all these things that's happening to us, this is not like because this is a curse from God. No. This is for your own good. But you know what? Sometimes we react in a different way. Instead of, who? Okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to teach me? James says, all you have to do is ask God for wisdom. That's all you have to do. 
Now, let's look at the test here. There are two disciples who took the test that day. Philip, he was appointed, because Jesus asked him. And of course, we have Andrew here, the brother of Peter, that he volunteered to take the test. Okay, let's look at our scripture. Philip, in verse 7, when Jesus asked him, where will we buy bread so these people can eat? How many people are there? Look at verse 10. How many people are there? 5,000. That's only the men. What about the kids and the women? So maybe about 8,000, 10,000 people there. Okay. So now, let's look at uh, Philip's reaction to the test here. Ah, he's so quick. He took his calculator. Did the math. He did the math right away. He said, ah, you know what, uh, Jesus? 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. Now, in some, some translations, maybe in the New International Version, is this uh, eight months' wages? Okay, let's look at this. Let's uh, put that in dollars. You have 10,000 people to feed. How much do you think it is going to cost right now? Right now. Do some math. $100. Make that right, Mark. Dollar menu, $10,000. $10, yeah. $10,000. Yeah. <laughs> $10, what is that, like a dollar each? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dollar menu. A dollar menu, huh? What about, what about tax? <laughs> Did you think about that? <laughs> okay. So we can see Philip here is so quick. I have to do his math. Ah. Uh, well, still no. We're going to be short. Uh, look at this. He's trying to solve the problem here with his calculator, the dollars, okay, which they don't have. Do you think they have this money to feed these people? Do you think Jesus has the money at that time to feed these people? You have to understand that they were living on donations. Do you think Jesus has a cash to feed these 10,000 people? But look at this, Philip calculated right away. <laughs> but his calculation is too short. <laughs> huh? It's like when we are, when we are, we encounter this kind of circumstances in our life, what do we do? We look at our bank account. Huh? How much do I have there? Oh, oh, these bills are piling. Oh. Okay. It's like what you have in your bank account is not enough. Now, let, let's look at Philip here. I mean, uh, Andrew. Andrew is a little bit resourceful here, you know? <clears throat> when he heard that Jesus was asking this question, where can we, 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 where can we buy food? Do you think there's a, there's a restaurant at that time to feed these 10,000 people? Hello? Not even, not even today we can have that. Huh? We need a, a Dallas Cowboys a football field <laughs> to put these people and, you know, feed them. Think about it. Well, Andrew. With his limited mind, <laughs> he tried to solve the problem too. Okay, let's do this. Hey, hey, Jesus, there's a boy here. He has five loaves and two fish. But look at what he said there. What did Andrew say here? One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many people? See that? He tried to be resourceful, but can you feed 10,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish? 
Hello? Still. You see this? If you look at this test that they did, you know, that they took this test, they failed. You know why they failed? Had they seen Jesus turn water into wine already, right? Remember, this is the fourth miracle that Jesus performed. And his disciples were with him the whole time. The whole time they were with Jesus. But still, look at the way they reacted to this impossibility. Are we reacting that way when we are facing these circumstances in our lives? You know, the reason why they fail is because they don't look to Jesus. They did not include Jesus in their solution. Do you do that too? Uh, do you pray to God? God, what's going on? Amen. There's nothing impossible with God. So let's look at the responses here. Look at Jesus' response to this impossibility. Okay. Let's go to verse 10 through 13. Then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. So they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. I want you to say this with me. As much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. You know our God can do exceeding abundantly more than you can imagine. Amen. Did you think about that? That our God is bigger than our imagination. Amen. You know, last Sunday, Brother Vic uh, tried to preach about the bigness of God. Awesome universe. You know, if you look at the biggest stars in the universe, our sun is not even a pinpoint if you look at the comparison. You see how big the sun is? Yeah, it's still big for us, right? But for the biggest star that God created, that sun is just a pinpoint. How much, is, how much more the earth? Maybe you're going to see the earth anymore in the picture. That's how big our God is. Amen. So why don't we try to limit Him? Okay. So Jesus. So when they went, when they were full, He told His disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled baskets were the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Wow. Twelve oh, baskets of leftovers. Did Jesus miss anyone? Huh? They were food. Huh? They ate as much as they wanted. Hallelujah. A buffet! <laughs> they have a buffet at that time. Uh, sorry, that was the first buffet right there. <laughs> with, with take out. <laughs> okay. Now, let's look at the response of the disciples. Did you know that uh, there are 37 miracles that was recorded in the New Testament uh, performed by Jesus? So, the first five is right here, or the first six, chap six chapters of uh, the book of John. 
So this is the fourth, the feeding of the 5,000, and then you have the walking on the water. Don't you know that the feeding of the 5,000 is all in the four Gospels? It's right there in the four Gospels. You know, there are others like parables. You don't see parables in the book of John. Do you notice that? But the miracles of Jesus, especially the feeding of the 5,000, they are in the four Gospels. How's that sound? Okay. So let's look at uh, Mark chapter 6. I like the uh, revision of Mark uh, than the, uh, in, in John here. So let's look at Mark chapter 6, verses 45 and 51. I'm going to read this to you. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them being battered as they rode because the wind was against them. Around three in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the sea, and wanted to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke with them and said, this is what Jesus said. The center, ego e me, me for base That was the very words of Jesus. That was in Greek. He said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. <laughs> now, if you look at verse uh, 52, let's look at verse 52 here. Because they had not understood about the loaves, instead their hearts were hardened. Now, they already saw four miracles performed by Jesus. Now, when they saw Jesus walking in the water, they still died. They thought he was a ghost. Are we reacting the same way? That we saw the miracles of Jesus change our lives? Huh? Are, are we still like that? That when we are faced with this impossibility, we doubt that. It's like, mm, God cannot do this. I don't think God will be able to solve this. Do you think about that now? They just saw Jesus perform the feeding of the 5,000. All of a sudden, they doubt, they doubt of him again. That's the reason why Jesus has to continue to test their faith. You remember the tempest. When Jesus was with them in the boat, and Jesus was sleeping there, huh? and there was a tempest, How did they react? You know, when they tried to wake up Jesus, they said, Do you care? Huh? We're going to die here. What did Jesus do? He just raised his hand. Wind, stop. And everything was? Cut. Another miracle to test his disciples. That's why my brothers and sisters, when we are testing, we have to look to God. We have to look to Him. God, what are you trying to tell me? God, give me the wisdom to understand this and to overcome this. Give me the strength 
from the context. Uh, okay, let's look at the people's response. Let's go back to chapter 6 of John, verses 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, Oh, this is really the prophet who was to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Did Jesus uh, took this opportunity to uh, become the king? Now, you have to understand that one time, Satan tempted him to do that too. Satan told him, you know what, if you worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. But what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? It is written, worship the Lord your God and him alone. You know, we cannot force Jesus. You know, sometimes in our circumstances, we cannot just force God to answer right away. It has to be on His terms. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Sometimes you have to wait. And when you wait, you have to be patient. Because patient is a virtue. Amen? It's a character building right there. So don't rush God, okay? Because it has to be on His terms. And let me tell you this. When God answers, He doesn't come too soon nor too late. It's always perfect timing. Amen. And you say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's, 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 let's uh, look about our, our response here. Is that how we view our impossibility as well? Is that how we should respond? To our circumstances? Yeah. We should look at Jesus, right? Yeah. Fix your eyes on Jesus because he is the author and the finisher of your faith. Hallelujah. Now, there are five valuable lessons here that we can apply for daily Christian living in the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Okay. First one, never assist, assess a difficulty in the life of your own resources. Don't be like Philip and, and, or Andrew. Okay? You look, you look at your, oh my goodness, how much do I have in my bank account? Or do, what do I have in my refrigerator? Or in my pantry? Okay? Never assess a difficulty in the life of your own resources. Now, the second lesson here is that little is much if God is in it. Say that with me. Amen. Little is much if God is in, in it. it. Amen. You see that five loaves of bread and two fish? God can multiply. Hallelujah. Next, Jesus alone can truly satisfy. They will feel as much as they want. Remember what uh, Brother Vic preached last Sunday. My God shall supply all your needs according to to his riches in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Lesson number four. Every difficulty is allowed or sent by God to enrich and enlarge us. So God uses every difficulty that comes into our lives for our benefit. God uses them to develop us. Amen. And the fifth lesson that we can apply in our Christian living is that what is over our head is under his feet. It's like God is telling you this. Hey, I got this covered. I got this under control. Amen. Just relax and see what happens. Amen. 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 Now, let me end my uh, sermon here on a story. Let me read to you the story. It's a beautiful story of a Jewish lady from Cuba. A Jewish lady in Cuba. This is a communist country. Now look at this. Let me read this to you. It's a beautiful story. You know, it helped my faith. It helped my faith. 
It was the last week of the month as I was getting ready to prepare our Sabbath meal. I stood in front of my pantry, looking at the empty shelves. What can I do? I thought. The small ration that the communist government of Cuba allowed per family per month was gone. Only two cups of rice and a small bit of oil and part of loaf of bread were left. From my summer garden, I had green plantain, two tomatoes, and a small head of lettuce. That was all the food I had to feed my family for Friday night, Sabbath and Sunday, because the first day of the next month was on Monday. I could not go to the store to buy more food until then. For my little family of three, my husband Hugo and our daughter Lina and me, there was not enough food. We usually had visitors come to our home for Sabbath dinner, but not this Sabbath, I thought. I put the rice to cook in a little pot. With one of the tomatoes, I made a little salsa and cooked six small meatballs made out of the single plantain. There it was, all of our food for two days. When Hugo arrived home that afternoon, I explained our food situation to him. Please don't invite anyone home for dinner tomorrow. I asked, he understood. When I heard our doorbell ring a little later, and went to see who was at the door. I heard the voice of a young man who had come from a distant city. We knew he was interested in one of the young ladies in our church. So we had told him that whenever he wanted to visit our church, he was welcome to stay in our home. But why today? I thought. The fact was, though, that he was there, and I knew that we would have to share what little food we had with him. While the young man took a shower, I quickly prepared a glass of water with sugar and a slice of bread for each member of my family. That was our supper. When our visitor came out of the bathroom, I served him a little rice, two of the plantain balls, and one leaf of lettuce made into a salad. We have already had our supper because we have to go to the church for the meeting, I explained to him. When we arrived at the church that evening, I learned that the girl, our friend, had come to visit was out of town. Oh no, I thought. Now, we will have to feed him lunch tomorrow. <laughs> My husband gave me the solution the next morning. Let's tell him that we are fasting today, so you can then give the food to him and Lena. I agree. While sitting in church that Sabbath morning, I noticed a man from a neighboring church attending with his young son. He had to bring his older son to a nearby hospital and had decided to stay at our church for the church service. My thought was, two more for lunch today. Later in the morning, Hugo whispered to me, there is a couple visiting from Havana. When I was in the seminary, I was assigned to the church where they are members. Many times they had me to their house for Sabbath dinner. We have to take them home. My immediate reaction was desperation. But in a flash, Bible stories pass through my mind. The manna in the wilderness, the oil and the flour of the widow, the little boy's lunch that the Lord used to feed five thousands. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, I remember. Trusting only the Lord, my provider, I answered my husband with a confidence. Sure, invite them home. The Lord will provide. When we arrive home after, after church, the visiting lady graciously offered her help in the kitchen. You're on vacation, I said. It's time for you to rest. I will take care of everything in no time. Going into my kitchen, I knelt in front of the stove on which sat those two little pots with almost no food in them. I told my Lord and provider, Lord, here are my fishes and my loaves. It is all I have. You have asked me to feed these people, and you ask your disciples to do that day longer. I give you what I have, you do the rest. While the rice and the plantain bowls were warming in the stove, I took the small head of lettuce and a tomato which I had saved for the salad. Walking over to my china cabinet, I reached in to take out a small salad bowl. But it was as if the Lord was talking to me. Where is your faith? Haven't you asked me to multiply your food? You need a larger bowl, enough for all the people, and some left over.
Forgive me, Lord, I said, taking out the largest salad bowl I had. As I took off these uh, leaves of lettuce, washed them, and cut them into my salad bowl, I did not see the leaves multiplying. But it seemed that the head of lettuce was always the same size, and more and more leaves were coming off it. When I finally got to the last leaf, the bowl was completely full. Then I began to cut the tomato, and it remained the same size until I had enough to combine with the lettuce into a nice tossed salad. The same thing happened with a small piece of bread. Always I was able to cut another slice until I had filled a basket. By now my faith was very strong. So I took out a big serving dish for the rice. I had to laugh when I saw that big dish beside the small pot. But I knew what the Lord was doing. I began scooping the rice into the serving dish and always the same amount was left on the pot until the dish was completely full. And there was still the same amount of rice left in the pot. Lord, I said, you are providing not only for these people today, but you are providing also for us tomorrow, aren't you? I could imagine a smile on his lovely face while he was nodding at me. Then came the plantain bowls. When I turned on the stove to warm the food, I saw that there were only four plantain bowls left. Now, I had a big bowl in my hand, and I smiled. In spite of myself, when I took the pot lid off, the pot was full of plantain bowls. I filled the big bowl full, and there were still enough bowls left in the pot for the next day. When I was ready, I went into the living room. To my husband, I said, honey, I know you were planning to fast today, but since we have this beloved brethren with us, why don't you join us for dinner? You can fast at any, uh, uh, any other time if you want. You go look at me as if you to say, are you out of your mind? As our visitors went into the bathroom to wash their hands, I led my husband to the dining room table. He could not believe his eyes, and two big tears rolled down his cheeks. And he said, thank you, Lord. And Sabbath dinner was the best dinner of our lives. Though a very simple meal, it was provided directly by the Lord. Yes, my friends, let me tell you this. My God shall supply. That's some of your needs. But all your needs. Amen. All you have to do is believe that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. Don't take that lightly. All you have to do is trust God that nothing is impossible with Him. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you really care. Because even David said, What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that you really care for him? Even Peter says, Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Lord, thank you that you really care for us and that you are going to provide for our daily needs. And even, Lord, in our overwhelming situation, you are there not to go demean us or to punish us yes, Lord. but Lord to strengthen our faith in you to develop us and build our character so Father help us but sometimes Lord in our overwhelming circumstances we easily doubt you Father remind us that in our little with you it can be a lot. Thank you, Lord, for today, for the words that you have reminded us that you care for us and that nothing is impossible for you to do. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.